All right, last thing, essential idea. Gene pools change over time. Now that's something you probably, you know, you figure. Um, but individuals die, they leave. Die, um, migrate away. Otherwise, you know, leaving the gene pool, mutations happen. Um, you know, adaptation, natural selection. All of these things, um, uh, you know, bottlenecks. Um, bottlenecks, so like, next, ah, which are uh, another way of saying genetic drift. And I'll show you an example later. We'll say genetic drift. But you guys know what a bottleneck is, right? You got all these genes, and oh, you just squeeze a couple out over here. If you take those individuals that just squeezed out and then reproduce them, they're not going to be the same as the general population here. So they're changing over time, as they should. So uh, one thing I'll be interesting at the end of this section talk about polyploidy so we are 2n right 46 so polyploid would be like just in one generation doubling um and having 92 so it would be, be 4n 92 chromosomes so a human with 92 chromosomes sounds wild it is and it hasn't happened like we can't handle even one extra chromosome like we have you know Barely, um, like trisomy 21, Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, trisomy 18. Sometimes you can get away with extra uh, X chromosomes, extra Y, but that's pretty much it. They think there might be uh, an Andean rat, and that's in your book, a type of Andean rat that can uh, do a polyploidy thing, but they're not quite sure. Okay. But very, uh, not very, but common in, more common in plants. Remember plants, along with their indeterminate growth, how they can just start growing when they feel like it, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. You go plants, is this idea being able to double their number of chromosomes in one generation. Like, what? That's insane. Um, but yeah, look at all these, look like some water, no, those are like, like wild boars. You see all their different um, genetic, you know, alleles all together. Um, an interbreeding population. Got to be interbreeding or else you can't have, you know, it's not a gene pool if you're not, you know, being able to be shared. And they're all the same species. Um, they reproduce and contribute that gene to that next generation. Okay, so any kind of animal or plant, we look at all those creatures that can, um, all those organisms that can reproduce, that would be the gene pool. Like the human gene pool is like all humans on Earth. And here's a good, I think this is a nice example showing how the... Um, Frequencies, remember, frequency is just how often they show up. They go over time. So we have, we start out with even number black rats and brown rats. Well, they're being hunted by this fox, and for some reason they can see those black rats better. So in the second generation, um, that allele, that, uh, that lowercase allele frequency it's just going to go down, right? Because um, we have we have some of these heterozygous, uh, you know, mice or rats that have that. But since you have uh, fewer of the little a little a's, that gene frequency goes down from 0.5 to 0.3, and then we can see at the end we don't see any of them. But if these two mice get together and have baby mice, do a little Punnett square, A, A, big A, little A, big A, little A, 
we can see if we work it out oh they can have black mice so they can always come back as long as you have some heterozygous in there everybody is homozygous you have to wait for another mutation so poor black mice are targeted by predators it's just not camouflage as well here we got more targeting by predators So just showing that now if you take take the fox away there's a good chance over time you'll go back to what you had before if you take the fox away take away that selective pressure <clears throat> what would happen if it did not adjust its population you know, probably go extinct because there's just going to be too many of those dark genes around and they're just going to eat by the predators. But now, they're better able to survive. But, in case, like we saw with the um, pepper moss, in case the environment changes again, they can change with it. So a lot of things can keep two, um, two populations of the same species from... Uh, reproducing one is temporal isolation that means they mate at different times so one mates one group mates in February the other mates in March they just can't work that out so mating at different times okay that's called temporal um, isolation seasons different seasons now there's behavioral um, they have different mating songs or dances Um, just think, oh, like um, birds have different feathers, right? Different physical characteristics. Um, just think, you know, what makes other people, what makes other people attractive to you? Like what attracts you? Um, and, you know, it really varies, right? Some people like certain personality traits and certain ways of style dressing. Some people hate that stuff. So this is our own human population. We can see a wide variety of potential behavioral isolation. I watch the dating shows and uh, I love it. What is it, 90 Day Fiance? Yeah. Is that 90 Day Fiance? No, no, um, Love at First, is it Love at First Sight? Um, I saw this one girl, she just saw him uh, and she just, no way, I'm not gonna be his, her, his husband her, or uh, his wife, not gonna do it. And she just shut it down. So she, there was some behavioral thing that she's isolating. Um, anyway, something physical. Uh, which, you know, sometimes works. Sometimes, you know, looks can be deceiving. And then we have a geographical isolation. is a big one. You know, they're just too far apart. Like long-term relationships, right? So distance. Um, there could be a body of water, a river, stream, or an ocean, mountains. Um, some big natural disaster like a hurricane, a flood, tornado, big winter storm, something. And they just, so these are all some ways that populations just, they won't mate with each other because of these um, blocks. I think these are interesting. So here's a little more information. This is temporal when they're mating at different times of the year. Um, this is called ecological when they're in different habitats. Ecological. Um, yeah, different boundaries. They just don't come into contact. Like for humans, we don't really have the ecological isolate mechanism anymore. And it hasn't been for a long time. Humans have been moving across the globe for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years actually. Um, different courtship behaviors, but um, the mechanical, and there's just, um, now, pretty sure that almost every dog could breed with each other, so I'm not sure if that's true or not. I gotta look into that. 
So you think a Great Dane Chihuahua couldn't have puppies? They might. Um, Post-zygotic means after you already had the uh, pre-zygotic is before you have a zygote, which is a fertilized egg. Here is after, so hybrid inviability. They just don't reproduce right. Something's wrong with it. Um, and this uh, hybrid infertility. You guys have all heard, you know, a horse and a donkey can get together and make a mule, but they have an odd number of chromosomes, so they're not able to make more mules. Um, but the uh, I'm sure there are exceptions to that. Nature's pretty sneaky. So it actually comes to reproduction. Um, and then hybrid breakdown. Those F1 hybrids are good, like the first generation. Hey, that's looking good. But then those when those hybrids mate, there's just something goes wrong. Um, and they just don't develop properly. Um, so I see copepods. This would be like a pond, like a small creature living in the ocean. Or, um, oh, I'm sorry, we've seen copepods in the LA River water, microorganism. So gotta watch that. Gotta watch out for that hybrid breakdown. Uh, could be gradual speciation. And this is called gradualism. See how they kind of gradually become different. And here we see abrupt separation events, okay, called punctuated equilibrium. That's the, uh, the term that might come up. Slow development of adaptations. Try that again. Oh, yeah. And that's slow, gradual. And then we have our punctuated equilibrium. Where you have some big cataclysmic event, some change in the environment. And the organism needs to change quickly to fit into that. That's where you're going to see that quick... Um, punctuated equilibrium. If everything is the same and the environment is not changing, it doesn't make sense to change um, because that change could could um, could hurt you. So if your an organism is working well in an environment, probably they're going to stay pretty stable until something happens to change. So it's kind of a fun little, ah, I just had to put this in here. Um, this is called allopatric, which is, which is a geographic speciation. We see a mountain range grew up between those trees and then kind of blocked them off. And then sympatric means they're not blocked off, they just have a reproductive, um, reproductively isolate themselves. So allopatric and sympatric. Kind of fun words there. Oh, directional, stabilizing, and disruptive. This is kind of fun. You see, um, when it's directional, like in this first one, you're either going, you know, bigger arm or smaller arm, taller or shorter, lighter, darker. You're going in one direction, okay, to be more successful. Like here we got um, long wiggly tails, help help the, uh, the little lizard there, the gecko. So they're just going to get longer and longer tails, okay, until it gets too long. Then, you know, it might be too much resources. But here we're going from one extreme to another of the average. Um, the middle one is stabilizing. So uh, like a human head size is a good one. Um, too big and you're not going to come to the birth canal. But too small, and your your brain not might 
might not be big enough um, to give you that level of success um, during your lifetime. So for humans, you know, our brain size or our, our, our head size has been stabilized for being too big. Because if it's too big, you're, you're going to kill your mom being born with what used to happen. And if it's too small, then you might not have, you know, as good of a chance at um, reproducing. So here we see the cat's tail is just the right length to be help stabilize it, um, but not drag on the ground, slow that cat down. And then disruptive is this last one, which is less common, which you're not, you're kind of making either all or nothing, either no tail or a big tail. And you don't have a whole lot in between. So there you go, directional, stabilizing, and disruptive. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Plants have this amazing ability to double their chromosome. Um, and onions, garlic, chives. I know you guys like these in your cooking. I love, I love it. Um, my wife, she uses a lot of onions when she cooks and it just makes things taste better. I don't typically, but I should. So we got doubling. Creates a large number of different phenotypes right away. And it's a really, I don't know, it's a pretty effective way to, to handle um, surviving in a changing world. So leave it to plants to be able to do that. And they've been around a lot longer than, than animals, so that kind of makes sense. They have developed this talent, this ability. So, and when you have that um, polyploidy, remember that's just when you take, say, 2N and you go to 4N or even more. Um, give an example. So an onion, um, you know, haploid is 8, um, diploid is 16. So tetraploid, you know, you take um, 4 times 8, um, you get 32. So now instead of having 16 it's got 32 and same thing with the pentaploid five times eight you know throw in another haploid number gets you up to 40 and then gets you up to 48 hexaploid so these are all um chromosome numbers that these onions chives leeks can have and you can see oh, i'll show you in the next one and you can see that here we have one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes. Now we just kind of doubled that two n number, okay? And one, two, three, four, five. So instead of six, we now have twelve. You can see how it's bigger. So there are some advantages to doing these um, these doubling events. So yeah, plants polyploidy. Don't forget, just a real, real cool ability plants have. Another reason makes plants awesome. So here's what I was talking about earlier, this bottleneck geographically isolated population. So say a population gets blown off of the mainland and lands on an island. You're not gonna have that many individuals and they're not gonna be a, probably a representative sample of what you had um, before you know, on on the mainland. So over here you have the original population. And then you see there's an even number of all the colors, all the different delicious colors. Go, go. <laughs> They're all even. Um, but then you have a bottleneck. And instead of all of them you just had these ones okay so this is the new population um say the geographically isolated Geo oops and since it's geographically isolated it's not going to be mixing in with that original population so it's not going to be getting refreshed with all the new all the alleles um yeah no.
So since it's not going to be refreshed, whatever you got out of the gumball machine, look, you don't have any blues anymore at all. And now you have mostly pink, you know, 35%, a lot of greens, you know, a lot higher. You know, these numbers are a lot higher than for the original population, lower for this. So you just have a new population, um, a new gene pool. And that's from these, you know, just a random selection of, uh, of, of individuals winding up on that island. Um, now this is also connected to an idea called genetic drift, where you just have these random selection of individuals. They go on to reproduce, and um, because you just had kind of a random selection um, and it wasn't representative, you just don't have that same gene uh, pool as you had in the previous population.